Welcome back to season two of Brewing the Facts. I'm your host and home brewer, Anthony Ozzo, and I'll be boiling the wort, adding extract and hops, and also racking the beer into the primary fermentation vessel today to remind those who forgot or for those who skipped the first episode of the season about the history of beer and the seeping of my grains, I am making a Scottish export ale modeled after the seventh doctor from classic Doctor Who, Sylvester McCoy. It's called Fenric's Revenge, a roasty peaty and malty scotch ale. Uh, before you see me bring this wort to a boil and add the extract, I thought it would be a fun time to actually discuss historic drinking games. Who doesn't like drinking games? While most of us know beer pong or flip cup uh, or drinking every time a bird flashes across the screen during the opening credits of the 1986 classic from Jim Henson, Labyrinth. Uh, drinking games have been a part of our human culture for a lot longer than you might think. Let's take a trip back to ancient Greece to learn about the game Cotabus. As we know from the previous episode, Ancient Greece was more about wine than beer, so the game of Katavas was a wine-slinging game. Why discuss this in a beer show? Well, sometimes we have to learn from history's mistakes. Katavas was an ancient game invented in the 5th or 4th century BCE. It is noted that it was actually invented in Sicily, but was most popular when it came to Ancient Greece. The game had two versions, but they both involved flinging the dregs of wine or the sediment left over from unfiltered homemade wine. In the most popular version, a small bronze disc, known as a plastinx, would be balanced on a pole. The players would fling the dregs of their wine and try to hit the plastinx to make it fall. When the disc fell, it would hit a metal plate and make a large crashing sound. Seats were arranged in a circle or square with the pole a few yards away. They would fling the wine out of a circular vessel with a handle on each side. The other version of the game involved flinging the dregs at bowls floating in water in the hopes of sinking them. Of course, the game was competitive, so players would practice their technique. It is said that the best technique involved propping up your left elbow, putting two fingers on the loop of one handle, and flicking the wine so that the dregs came out in a high arc to hit the target. Kinda like throwing a javelin. This game was played at parties called Symposia, and some demonstrations of the game prove that wine would have gotten everywhere. Imagine if someone missed or flung too hard. Perhaps that was a strategy. I mean, that one person who made fun of your hair? Time to get him in the eye with some wine, right? At the very least, you would then make it tougher on them to score. The winner would play for a prize, which included kisses or other favors from women known as heteri. No need to go into specifics about what those other favors were. We'll let your imaginations run wild. It is noted that the women also played the game, so they weren't just there like that. But besides the naughty aspects, sometimes throws were dedicated to lovers. Though that could be crass too, with certain body parts being celebrated a lot of the time. The game did eventually fade from popularity though. It was challenging, so the game would have to be taught thoroughly to new players. And the cleanup probably wasn't all that great. I mean, imagine having to clean up wine, sediment, and possibly other substances after every game. My guess is that role was given to the player voted worst. And that's why I choose beer over wine, though the Tour de Franzi has an epic tale from friends about saltines and pool noodles best left as a funny little secret story. The wart's now coming to a boil and my nose definitely approves. Uh, just don't get too close to the steam. <coughs> Joking aside, we do have to be careful with the next steps. No one wants to burn their extract and no one wants the wort to overflow from the pot. Uh, so once the pot does finally come to a boil, we have to take it off the burner and stir in the extract. Of course, I'm using British Maris Otter uh, liquid malt extract here and uh, 
you know, this is kind of pretty common in most uh, British ales, and so I wanted to use it here. It's kind of a, uh, the equivalent in America would just be like kind of a light extract. And I'm using six pounds of this, by the way, uh, to kind of finish the, the mash itself. So let's get to adding. Look at that syrupy goodness. And to ensure we get all the extract, I usually add a little bit more water, uh, you know, shake up the bottle or can, try to get as much of the extract out as possible. Make sure I maximize this as well. And of course, uh, we're stirring in the extract, making sure it doesn't stick or burn. We're gonna bring this back to a roiling boil. And of course, it will be boiled for 70 minutes. We just wanna remember to stir about every 10 minutes because uh, you know it can burn on the bottom and we don't want those off flavors. While stirring every 10 minutes can really be boring to a lot of people. I'm Italian, so I'm kinda used to making those 12 hour marinara sauces and stirring all the time. You know, obviously, sipping on beers also helps, which I will be doing, but for the rest of you, let's get back to the historic drinking games. And it's true that Greece wasn't the only civilization getting in on the fun. China also wanted to pass the time uh, with a little bit of drinking competition. Uh, and we get to the ales rules, which was very popular during the Tang Dynasty. Has anyone ever played King's Cup? Maybe you don't remember. Maybe you don't want to remember, due to the penalty you received for picking the last king in the deck. I know you know that weird concoction of alcohol and beer and possibly some fruit punch. Regardless, even if you do remember, you may not know the origin to this roulette of a card-picking social drinking game. Those can be traced back to the Tang Dynasty in China between 618 and 907. They invented a game called the Ales Rules. In this game, a cup contains sticks with inscriptions. The inscriptions would most likely be instructions to say who would drink next. This would vary to the person who pulled the stick, the best drinker in the house, the youngest drinker, the highest official, etc. And the sticks would also say how much you should drink. Unlike in college, when the game was a free-for-all, the Ales rules had referees to maintain order, make sure the rules were being followed. Referees would actually have the power to give penalties to players that annoyed them or who were just blatantly disrespecting the rules. The penalty would usually be to drink a full cup and these penalties could stack to the point where the only options were to run away or to try and drink everything. But running away was considered a disgrace and the player would be banished from the game. I assume there were a lot of people passing out because of that. Or a lot of people come into parties with a new name and a disguise. I played King's Cup many times in college, and let me tell you, it's not fun when the cup is filled with a quarter Malibu, quarter Natty Ice, quarter Jack Daniels, and a quarter Grenadine. I wish we had referees enforcing rules too, because uh, people would join the game halfway. Of course, they'd have that glass of Grenadine because they were already drunk, couldn't find anything else in the house. And of course, like clockwork, they'd always pick a king and it would be added to the cup. Uh, and when only one king remained, it became Russian roulette until someone unfortunately picked it up. Seriously? Of course, this ward is smelling a lot better than that drinking cup that we were talking about. And now it's time to add some hops. I'll be using two ounces of Willamette hops for this boil. Uh, these hops are spicy, peppery, and earthy. Uh, it should add a nice compliment to the Scotch Ale. Um, this is another favorite process for me, uh, opening the package, smelling the aromas from the hops, and of course, uh, as the hops boil in the wort. Uh, I'll be adding half this bag, about an ounce, um, at the 30 minute mark of the boil, and then the other half at the 50 minute mark of the boil. So, I mean, the, the, the kind of peppery spiciness of these hops is just so, so good. You can almost taste them as you smell them.
The grains and the hops are blending quite nicely in my nose. And we're getting uh, very close to the end of this boil. Uh, in the final few steps of the fermentation process. While we wait, let's move on to the next drinking game in our little feature here. This one invented in ancient Rome, but became popular in 1800 BC in Italy as well. It's called a passatella. And let's just say it's very Italian. Another game that featured wine at the time, with it being in Rome, but this was a game that certainly got out of hand, that's for sure. This one actually existed for many years. But in an account from 1861, the newer version had two positions, the Padrone and the Sada Padrone, which means boss and underboss in Italian. The Padrone was earned by playing cards, dice, bocce, or through a hand game that was like rock, paper, scissors with math added into it. The Padrone would choose the underboss and give them a quart of wine. And then the rest of the wine, which was purchased equally by everyone playing, would be divvied up at the discretion of the Padrone. But that isn't all. The Padrone would actually taunt the players as wine was passed out. And some people could even be refused wine. This, of course, would cause a lot of problems. A French chronicler named Edmund About claimed that someone who kept losing and not getting able to drink any wine stabbed the Padrone earlier at the tavern he was at. And whether this is true or not, it's up to you to decide. I mean, they could have been messing with the Frenchman here, but the account had mentions of people telling about it wasn't a big deal because everyone had pulled a knife on a friend at some point while playing the game. I mean, that's quite competitive. <laughs> The only thing that would make this more Italian is if Gabagool was involved. You know, you gotta get that Gabagool. Wounded pride aside, pulling out weapons because of a drinking game is obviously pure lunacy. I can only imagine how the Romans handled this. Caligula probably forced people to drink fish oil or something, and then thought that they were turning into a half fish, declared war on them, and probably murdered them. Uh, still, I've played uh, drinking games like Mafia, if anyone's played that, uh, which kind of seems a little close to this, right? Like, it seems like it might be based off of Pazitala. Uh, for those who survived their duels, if you tried to play this game, we'll now be moving on to the racking of the beer and the pitching of the yeast. First, we must cool our beer, of course, and you can do this with a wart chiller like I have right here. Uh, this is recommended, of course, but you, in the past, I have put the pot in a tub of cold water and ice. It just takes a very long time. I mean, who has an extra two hours, right? So let's cool this beer down. We started with three gallons in our boil, probably closer to three and a half, but that is now down to closer to two and a half as you do lose some in the boiling process. With our sanitized six gallon carboy, uh, we had filled it about halfway with water. So we're talking three, three and a half gallons of water. The rest is gonna be our wort. Uh, we're gonna siphon this in and try to filter out as much of the hop particulates as possible. Check out that color, everyone. It's starting to turn that kind of scotch ale, kind of golden brown. It will probably be a little darker as it goes, uh, but uh, already you kind of see how the water kind of takes away some of that super dark war color that you get. But the beer itself will be kind of a dark amber um, and uh, it's gonna be pretty good. So we fill this guy up. And uh, we, the reason, again, the reason why we had to make sure it was cold water in there and why we used the wart chiller. You can't pitch yeast if it's too hot. It'll kill the yeast. So you gotta make sure it's at room temperature at least. And this uh, makes sure that we get there. So um, it's gonna be good. You guys getting excited? Cause I know I am. So 
So now that our carboy is filled with the warts, uh, we must pitch the yeast, and I'm using White Labs WLP028 Edinburgh Scottish Ale yeast right here. Um, this yeast is actually made in the pouch, it says. It says it's a pure pitch, so some of the freshest yeast that you can get and that it's never been in the elements. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially we're ready to go. We're ready to go here. It's ready to be pitched. Uh, but before I do that to close out day one of my brewing day, let's check out one more drinking game before we go. The Puzzle Jug in 18th, 19th century France. It must be said that many of these strange, ancient, or older drinking games were done with wine based on the region they were from. Imagine that. Wine is stronger than beer and people were drinking quarts at a time. So now we reach France, which loves their wine, and a game called the Puzzle Jug. This was a game played in medieval times and in the 18th and 19th centuries. A vessel known as a Puzzle Jug was used and filled with wine. The goal of the game is simple, be able to drink without spilling anything. Easier said than done. There were holes at the top of the jug and as many as six spouts with hidden tubes that ran inside the jug from the handle to other sections. So unless someone was able to memorize the correct spout on the jug, they would fail the test and have wine all over their clothes and face. But even then, some tubes had a hidden hole that meant that the person had to drink a certain way or tilt the jug a certain way, even from the correct spout. This game did eventually make it to Holland and Germany, so I would assume that ale was probably used at some point, but most accounts mention wine as the drink for this jug. And these types of jugs can still be found either as expensive antiques or modern versions made for art. The winner was the person who spilled the least. Imagine spilling wine all over your house or on your clothes. Uh, talk about an expensive drinking game. France and their wine, right? How much better would this a game been with beer? I mean, as someone who has taken beer bungs in the past in college, drink a full beer in two gulps, the thought of doing that with wine does make me a little queasy. Still, the art of playing games and drinking is apparently humanity's pastime all the way to ancient times. It will be a while before we're playing any games with this scotch ale as it's gotta go through the fermentation process. I've added the yeast and we gotta make sure this fermentation lock is in place. And of course, uh, I gotta check back, 24, 36 hours, it's gonna start exploding. Uh, you put a little bit of water in here so that the gas escapes slowly. And of course, if it starts to go too nuts, we put in a blow off tube into a bucket with sanitized water to make sure that, you know, nothing's going nuts and exploding. And of course, we're gonna look at all those things, all the fermentation process and the Krausen and secondary action when we're putting this in the secondary vessel, dry hopping as well, all in the third episode coming up. So join me again, and we'll group to the sounds of beer as well. Until next time, salut.